And welcome everybody. Let's uh let me play my little video here. Cute, right? I made that with Canva. <laughs> um Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I should say it in the other order. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you happen to be around the world. Welcome to Tales from the Jar Side, the video series. Today I am joined by the inimitable Greg Turnquist, who is a good friend and the head of the... Ooh, what's on your mug? I can't read it. Oh, I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. Ah, oh, it's a Marauder's map. Okay. The Marauder's map on it. Which I'm kind of sad. I, I get that. Oh, and, and Bill is here. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? I I kind of knew Bill would make it. <laughs> uh, Bill's my friend. So at any rate, uh, Greg is the head of the Spring Data JPA project. Did you notice that I fixed the uh, ad for that? I made sure it, <laughs> the poster had the right uh, um, attribution on it. Well, I didn't... I. I appreciate that. I was panicked when I saw your notice go out and I didn't want the spring data team lead to come after me for that. So I was like, let me, let me set it the record straight very quickly. Oh, he'd blame me. Not, not you, <laughs> right. I mean, you would think, but at any rate, I did in fact uh, fix that. So we should be good now. And uh, I, it turns out that, that that updated the YouTube one without a problem. That was fine. But on LinkedIn, it meant I had to remove it and then add it back in or something like that. Uh, maybe that's why the link that, that I tried to send you didn't make it or something like that. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, let's, let's introduce you. So why don't you tell our thousands of attendees, <laughs> tell Bill who you are. Well, go go ahead and go ahead and click in the comments. You can you can throw up Bill's comment here, so it uh, it, it it shows it to everybody. Yeah. I did. There you go. How about that? There you go. And he's following us on LinkedIn. So the, I, I'm 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 proud to be here for this inaugural live stream for Tales from the Jar Side. Um, right. I've actually been I've been a part of the Spring Team going all the way back to 2010. So I'd like to I like to lay credit. I like to lay claim to the fact that I'm the first person to join the Spring Team after the acquisition by VMware. So. So that was the first time, right? The first acquisition by VMware, not the second acquisition. Yes, that's a very valid point. I wasn't even thinking of that when I said that. So we joined way back in when. Now they, so but they, um, I got in. I got in technically six months ahead of Josh Long. But uh, oh wow, how about that? So well, see, I knew. Um, well, I knew uh, Craig Walls, of course, who's been very active there for years. I remember Jeff Brown, when Jeff was a member of, well, when he and about half a dozen of his friends formed G21. Do you remember that one? Right. Yeah. yeah that was, that was... The Groovy and Grails company, right? And and then they were acquired by SpringSource before it was, I mean, what well, was still SpringSource. And then SpringSource became, got acquired by VMware. And then VMware, from what I recall, split off Pivotal. And they were part of Pivotal. And all that happened to Jeff, he said, is that his email address changed four times. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. So, yeah, I got, I'd made it in as, as being part of the, uh, per se, commercial engineering team. SpringSource had started some commercial products that would hang off to the side. And... Um, so I would get on, I, I, I got in there, but my, my secret goal was to, to, to make it to the, to the uh, official spring team. So I got in uh, right, right ahead of Josh Long, Craig Wallace and Roy Clarkson. Those are like some of the big hires that year, but all three of those people were per se hired directly into the spring team. So who, who got in first is kind of like up for grabs, depending on how you want to tabulate. But um, I later got to join the de facto spring team, like something like a year later, whatever. So where were you before that? Um, I had worked for this company called Harris Corporation. Now they're known as L3 Harris. Um, it's kind of freaky because it's this company that's like over 100 years old that has morphed multiple times. Like at one time they owned a photocopier business, but uh, I'd worked out of there out of college and uh, in, a, in, a, in a move to try to relocate after I, shortly after I'd gotten married and when we started having uh, kids, we wanted to move closer to family and my old company had no presence in Middle Tennessee. So I started job shopping so you should mention that where are you in tennessee again 
Uh, we're in, we are in Clarksville, Tennessee. So you can catch the last train to Clarksville if you want to. So <laughs> and I'll meet you at the station. And, yes. and, and if you I, know that you're old. Okay. Yes. There's just no way to say it elsewise. I was going to say that's a seriously dated reference, but you know, you and I fit and I know Bill fits and that Bill says that Josh is still doing his own live stream at the moment. Uh, that just figures, doesn't it? So that's a, that's, I'm, I'm trying to think if, if we need to be uh, insulted that he's not telling people to come to ours or if he's going to be insulted if we don't tell people to go to his. But Well, I got to admit that he's part of the reason that I started using StreamYard. Uh, I'd heard of it earlier as a way to, to do multiple streams, to stream on multiple platforms. But when I was at GIDS, the, the, the conference in India, in Bangalore, about, well, a little less than a month ago, uh, Josh showed up late <laughs> and unexpectedly. Ah, Bill says he learned spring from Craig Walls at good old Collin County Community College. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, Craig was in Texas, as I recall. Yeah, Craig was in, uh, wasn't he mm -hmm. in the Dallas area as well? I, think, I, think I remember him being, um, I'm, what I remember him being precisely was near Plano, Texas, which is yeah. the headquarters of Dr. Pepper. Oh, I didn't realize that part. <laughs> so, which explains yes. a lot, actually, you know, <laughs> at any rate, I was at uh, Gids in India at Bangalore and Craig showed up, not Craig, Josh showed up late. And of course he gave a talk, but uh, he happened to, walk into the speaker room when I was there and I was just sitting there trying to get ready for something or talk or whatever. Actually, I think what had happened was is I'd realized I'd left my charger back in the hotel. <laughs> so I had to take a trip back to the hotel and then come back again with my charger. And therefore I'm just sitting in the speaker room trying to get some stuff done when in walks Josh and we started talking and I mentioned I've got a YouTube channel now, and of course, so does he. And he said, oh, well, come be on my live stream. So that evening, that Friday evening, I went over to his hotel room, which was nice, by the way. Josh doesn't stay in, in uh, ordinary place. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, he did. He set up the live stream on hotel Wi-Fi, which that was brave. Yeah. Like 10 minutes beforehand total. But it's Josh. So we had, oh, I don't know, a couple dozen people show up even at the last minute like that, uh, asking questions and doing things like that. And, and Josh took, pointed out to me that he's been doing like he just decided that while he, he spent a lot of time for a while making complex videos with high production values and everything, he's changed his mind. And now he's just doing constant live streams at all the conferences he attends. So if you look at his list of live streams on his YouTube channel, the, what, I think it's called Coffee Plus Software. Right. Yeah. Then the one that we did three weeks ago is like now 15th on the list. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> he's just been cranking them out. So I shouldn't be surprised at all that he's doing one now as well. Well, you try to go, you, you get bitten by the bug. Like I had started watching people doing live streams, right? I decided to get into doing YouTube videos back in 2019. I was, ah. um, I decided to go indie on writing books and I was like, I, I want to write another book, but I'm, I'm fed up with my past publisher. So uh, maybe if I made some YouTube videos, then I could say, you know, by the way, I have a book and so I could find this traffic of people coming. Right. And then I started finding out there's like a whole genre out there of how to make YouTube videos. I started watching all these people uh, and I'm like, wait, I could do that too. And, and then my old publisher actually came back to me in the middle or towards the end of the, the pandemic stuff saying, we want to do another edition with you. And I, I said, you know, basically I, I didn't like the way they handled things the last time. And they say we've changed. And so I made a laundry list of, I want all these things and, I want higher pay rate and you're going to give me a lighting kit for my YouTube studio and a, <laughs> a stream deck. And, and, and I sent it over and my wife was like, what are you, you're out of your mind. They're not going to take any of that. And they accepted all of it in 24 hours, which wow. in business parlance means I didn't ask for enough. Who, who was, who was the publisher? Uh, it's packed publishing. Um, oh, oh, of course. They've, um, well, I, I ended minute. up hang writing. On. Uh, okay. Hang on one second. Let me share up my screen here. Ah, of course. So let's see. Screen share on this window over here. And this is um, YouTube and your channel is called Spring Boot Learning. Uh, 
and you're whoops. I want to mute the yeah, app. Pause that. <laughs> yeah, waiting for that to come up. And then, ah, this is the one where you're looking up for some reason. It has at your that, own logo. Um, it has that, you know, editorial style to it. It's... Well, I think you're looking at your own title for some reason. <laughs> right? And you've got, oh, let's see what it's up. What are you up to now? 6.36 thousand. So 6,360 something. Did I tell you I hit a milestone this morning? No, what is it? 300. <laughs> the first 100 is the first time you hit when you hit 100. It's super exciting. I mean, I, I, it's like, so that is nothing to balk at. Yeah. Well, I hit 300 today. So that means I'm only, what is that, 120 times smaller than yours? <laughs> Something like that, you know? No, not 120 yet. Maybe no, 110. Well, no, 300 times 10 to 3,020, 20x. Oh, yeah, 20 some, right. Yeah, 20, yeah, about 20, 21 times. Yeah, less than you. No, you're going to start doing math in your head the next time you go give a talk at a conference and you're going <laughs> to you're going to walk into the room and say, how many people are in this room? This is like 80 people. This is like just a fourth of the number of people that actually come to my YouTube channel. So here's your live. And oh, so these are... Um, a month ago, 10 months ago. So you, you were on a, a string there for a while. Yeah. Ten three months. of them, the three at the top, I actually, you know, or the four, the four one, I did like four nights and four different nights in, in a row, roughly speaking. But Were they by yourself or with other people? No, those were, those were by myself. I was like, let oh. me try to test this. Let me try to test that. Let me try to test this. And each one was sort of a different focal point, but I did them live. So it's like, let's do a live coding session. Oh, well, as long as we're doing something silly here, uh, let me get rid of this garbage that we were talking about earlier on my app. Um, but I will switch back to, let's see, my main branch. And it's not complaining about doing that. Wow, that's that's progress. I love how you have the Nightcat progress bar at the bottom of the page, the, the colorized. Hey, yeah, it's it's called a uh, Nyan progress bar. Yeah, see, here's my plugins, just so you know. So if I go to plugins, I got to go down to N here. There it is. It's Nyan progress bar. I always called it Nyan, but my son corrected me. Uh, it's, it's Nyan okay. progress bar. Pretty progress bars with Nyan Cat for IJ based IDEs. So I'm using that one. And of course, the other one I'm using all the time is good old GitHub Copilot, right? Yeah. I have not f stepped into that arena yet of GitHub Copilot yet, but oh, Dan it's... Vega Dan Vega has for sure. <laughs> well, Dan Vega, by the way, hit 30,000 subscribers last week. I know. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm always chatting with him. I'm like, whoa, dude, man, you're, you're killing it. But, uh, but he's not thinking 30,000. He's thinking 3 million. You just know Dan, right? You know, <laughs> we'll see I how I talked to him back in 2020 when I was uh, kind of towards the end of 2020. I was like, all my motivation was just shot dead because of lockdowns, et cetera. And so I was like, I got all this spare time, but I can't shoot a video while I got, I mean, no, not spare time because all the kids were home from school as well. But I chatted with him at Christmas time and he was just short of 10,000 subs. And somehow, chatting with him for an hour, I hung up and suddenly had like 50 ideas in my head for making videos on Spring Boot content. Well, he had, I mean, he's only been a member of VMware for what, six months or less? Uh, may, I, maybe about a year or so. I can't remember his exact date, but I've, I've corresponded with him through Twitter, you know, going all the way back to 2020 and stuff. But um, he got, yeah, he came on board in the, the the past year and i've been like y'all you you and deshaun have been killing it on content creation so i think they've done a great job at opening up that front and not leaving it to just josh to do live streaming and stuff but instead put out a big you know message on you know here's spring content here's how to use security here's how to do um grawl here's how to do spring data you know just a, just a whole whole comprehensive message out there that i think has been very effective well, uh, Bill, by the way, mentioned the Star Trek uh, progress bar, which I was somewhat underwhelmed by, by the way. Just I, I did try that one out. It looks like a tiny little enterprise looked at from above. 
going back and forth, but it just didn't have the same impact. I, I stuck with the, the Nyan cat. I think that one <laughs> still looks better. Um, yeah, I know, uh, uh, Craig is, I'm not Craig. I keep doing that. Uh, Dan has been doing very, very well on his and that's good. Um, what I wanted to show you here, by the way, is I finally added my test containers stuff in here. So you can Aha. see down here, there's my test containers, uh, spring boot plugin and as well as the JUnit Jupiter one, because I need the extension for JUnit 5. And right. I don't have, well, I do actually, but I've listed the MySQL and the PostgreSQL databases. I don't have Postgres installed locally at all. I have MySQL, but it's not working with that. And what I, what I didn't install is the, um, I don't have the Docker desktop on this machine, or rather I haven't restarted it since my last reboot. What I uh, do have, and I know you're not gonna be able to see this, is Test Containers Cloud. Oh, I can see that, that's cool. Ah, uh, so <laughs> what I did is um, I added a container config under test configuration. So this is my, my, SQ, my SQL container and my Postgres container just being instantiated and returned as service connection. And then I put in my test here, which is a data JPA test that imports that container config. Turns out I had to add this as well. And oh, this, yeah. this doesn't quite work because I learned something that I didn't know, uh, which you probably know immediately. I always thought, and I couldn't believe this was the default, but I, I couldn't, I always thought that um, create drop for hibernate was the default setting in hibernate, which I was appalled by, but that's, that's what it always been for me. And now I know better that it is the default setting. If you are in, in embedded database mode. Yeah. Oh, uh, you see, you knew it. Yeah. So I've got one I policy have, for embedded and then they have a different one for everything else. And this yeah, is something none, that kind of, apparently. So at any rate, I had to add this DDL auto for Hibernate and I mean for um, Postgres and for um, MySQL so that if I go back to my test now, this is going to just create some products in my setup and then assert that there's three in the database. And if I run this monster, it shouldn't take too long, uh, just that I've got to clear the cache and everything because I was playing with that Grawl native image stuff. Um, by the way, who do we report that problem to? I don't even know where to mention it because nobody, I tried Googling it. Nobody's seen it yet, apparently, or if they have, they haven't said anything. Josh didn't run into that problem. He, what's that? Let me look. It's the spring initializer, I think, is what you're running into. Yeah. Um, Maybe Josh used the groovy DSL inside of Gradle. Oh, no, no he must have used Maven. And I bet they don't have the problem in Maven. Yeah, that's probably also true. Yeah, no, I, I use the Kotlin DSL because I got tired of looking at, at suggested errors in the Groovy DSL when the errors weren't actually errors in the, the, in the uh, Gradle build file. Well, I sent you a private chat message of the repository for the Spring Initializer, so that's where you can report issues. Where that. do you have it? Uh, I sent you a private chat message, so. Oh, thank you. Ah. Okay, and I'll assume it's there. So, at any rate, um, oh, good. Now everything's failing. Yes, illegal state exception. By the way, for me, I know you're from Tennessee, but I live in Connecticut, and illegal state exception for me is New York. But I'm <laughs> just so you know. So this error is no such bean definition exception. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, the service. So. What happened over here was um, I have a repository going through it, or my initializer, I have a, what do you call it, a, a command line runner. Oh, yeah. That calls a method in the service. So the data JPA test, uh, I don't think works properly because it's not loading the service bean. Okay. Can you make but, a mock bean for it then? Well, I could do that, or I think I could just switch this to a spring boot test. Yeah, that's the other thing. When you use the uh, slice based testing, you, you, I think I thought it's very cool, but I, I start to quickly hit the hit the limits of like there's certain stuff that's actually disabled when you use the slice based right, testing, and right. so 
But you um, could make a mock, but I don't want to make a mock at the moment. Maybe you'll come back to that, though, because uh, that would give me a chance to use mock bean, wouldn't it? Well, it would. That's that's your option of um, yeah. what, you know. Bill says for him, of course, the <laughs> the illegal state exception is Oklahoma, of course. <laughs> uh, did I tell you I heard a gag here? Uh, I heard a ga an Oklahoma joke, actually, believe uh -oh. it or not. And the, the funniest part about it is where I heard it. Anyway, first of all, let's just see this. Yeah, now this is passing. So there's my, uh, in my setup, there's the delete all. So it selects them and then delete one, delete two, delete three. And then there's my insert of one, two, three, and then select count. And of course, all I have is one test here. But the point is, is that if I go back to the root here, you'll see this is running with, let's scroll over. Uh, I don't know what this container is. Are you? Oh, it's it's test containers manager. It, it ah. manages all the containers. Okay, but the point is, is that I get uh, where is it? I saw something nasty. There's my SQL right there. Ah. Okay, and then below that, here is Postgres. So in fact, it's running on both, I believe. Although I don't know if it's using either one of those for the JPA part. No, the nasty part during the initialization, during the initial startup, it complains about a test context AOT exception for some reason and then resets itself and goes, yeah, okay, I got it now. Yeah, code generation not supported for bean definitions, declaring an instant supplier callback inside Flyway of all things, which... I mean, I'm still in create drop mode. I didn't know. Does does Hibernate use Flyway as part of the create drop configuration? I don't know. I'm not sure what that is because I I'm like yeah, I don't know. But at any rate, the point is, uh, this seems to be working, and I can't tell if it's definitely working with MySQL and Postgres. You know what I mean? I, it could very well be using the H2 database that's in there because I've got all three at the moment. But it, it definitely loaded the containers for MySQL and Postgres, and that's good. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you'd almost have to like put a breakpoint and pause it, and then can you peek inside the repository and look at its uh, connection? I mean, I'm looking at the SQL, and to. the SQL for something that simple just isn't different enough. See, you know, you've, you've uncovered a fabulous thing of uh, Hibernate. See, Hibernate has hidden from you the database you're talking to. So, Right, exactly. Is yeah. it is it MySQL? Is it Postgres? Nobody knows. Uh, yeah, nobody can tell. And if I have both of them, but the container is started and it is running. And I definitely don't have Postgres on this machine at all. Oh, and by the way, the other thing I did, and the reason I structured it this way, because, you know, there, there's that blog post where they talk about how to use test containers with Spring Boot. And what, what I can do after I have this containers config is I added test application with a main method in it. And oh, this yeah. One, yeah, you do your normal from. That's the, that's the one that had the main method in it with the containers config. And this means that even though I have this under source test Java, I can run this as a main method and it will start up the app with Postgres and MySQL. See, there's MySQL right there. Yeah, that's one of the cool new things they put out in Spring Boot 3.1 is this ability. Right. I mean, they've really made it easy to, I think a lot of people were already sort of pseudo half-baking this along the way. They're like, wait, test containers is my ticket to spinning up whatever I need. Right. You know, instead of just in a test case, can I throw it, can I remove its test-based dependency? And so I, I like this approach. The Spring Boot team said, let's let's make it a first class citizen to have sort of a test application. Right. And engine equals NODB. That's definitely my SQL. Right. Right. So that one came up um, and there's test containers cloud. It's using my my cloud provider, apparently, which, OK, good, you know. So at any rate, for me playing with this for less than a week. I think, okay, I'm happy. It seems to be working. Let me shut it down. Uh, and then, of course, I hit the problem I was telling you, which uh, I'll mention to Bill, because why not? Oh, we've got some more people, by the way. 
Uh, there's a question here. Let me click on it so you can see it, or everybody can see it. It says, are the spring configurations for both MySQL and Postgres databases? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Uh, spring configurations, I didn't have to configure anything manually. All I did was add the dependencies to my, um, to my build file and then create the containers inside this test configuration class. And again, there's a blog post about this, which I'll have to post in the um, in the chat, which was from the the uh, regular. Sorry, I was trying to find it while I was talking. It's probably not a good idea. At any rate, there was a blog post from the Atomic Jar people that talked about this when when uh, three point one came out. So that I didn't, and uh, Bill asked about Flyway. I didn't explicitly add Flyway at all. That isn't one of my dependencies in the build file. As you can see here, this is my list of dependencies. So there's no Flyway support in there. Ah, somebody, uh, and hello, Simon says hello. And it's like, hey, Simon, how are you? Hey, quickly, everybody in the chat, go hit the like button like immediately. <laughs> the like button on what? On YouTube. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button. Oh, on this, this uh, on the on the live stream. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. I suppose I should do. <laughs> any oh, rate, uh, man. but getting back to the the question, I didn't do any actual configuration for Postgres or MySQL other than adding the drivers at runtime and adding the test containers dependency with the the, the test containers MySQL connections as well. And done. So uh, actually, I don't see a link that Simon, you said you sent uh, a link and I don't see where that is. Um, Greg, you don't see anything, do you? No, no, I'm not. Uh, Simon and uh, I'm going to assume Ulysses, I think, are, are uh, viewing it through the YouTube channel. So Ken's this oh. fun inaugural episode is being multi-streamed both to YouTube and to LinkedIn. So let me go to YouTube and I just have to remember to mute it, right? Continue yeah, that's, I've YouTube. got the tab muted. There. And uh, let's see. Oh, it's. Oh, if you put a, U, a URL link, that's probably, yeah, it may have been barred because it's. Some of the oh, bots they go just out don't want the URL. Garbage. I see the comment, but it didn't. Uh, yeah, the link didn't go through and I didn't do anything to stop that. So that's not me. Um, I'll give you my, I mean, you have my email address though, right here. Let me just post my email address. Yeah. Fly away and wild fly. You know what I got? Okay. Let me do my, let me do what I was doing and then I'll do my rant real quick. At any rate, there's my email address, uh, posted in the chat. Okay. Uh, no, my rant about wild fly is that that is one of the, I'm guessing top five worst names for any product and ever. I mean, seriously, they named their app server, JBoss Application Server. That was a perfectly good name. I had no problem with that. And then they changed it to Wildfly. And Wildfly is not something you want to use. Wildfly is something you want to swat. I mean, they uh. named their product after a bug. I mean, seriously. And here, if you look at it, here's the, uh, the logo. Wildfly Server, that'll do it. I mean, look at this thing. It looks like a bug. I mean, that's hideous. I don't want that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's not the worst. You know what the worst one is? The worst software product name entirely. I won't even read emails from Cockroach DB. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm okay, not that oh, one. Simon um, agrees. The name change did surprise me. Yeah. Simon, I know yeah, Simon. Cockroach DB kind of makes me, you know. Do now, that, Fly so. is a good name. I agree with Bill. Fly is an excellent name, right? Of course, his name is Fly, you know? And there's a whole pretty Fly for a white guy reference in there as well and all that. Flyway, I mean, I have no problem whatsoever. Um, I have no Put problem comment whatsoever there. In the, um, with Flyway. I mean, with that name. It's just Wild Fly. That's a bug. You know, I don't like... At any rate, uh, Simon, I agree with you that the test container support is one of the big reasons to upgrade to 3.1. I mean, it really is. It, we, I mean, I use Spring Boot. I mean, in fact, here, I'll show you this. Uh, if I go to GitHub, I did a talk about 
test containers on the No Fluff Tour. And here is, um, here's one of the repositories I use. Like this one was for Sequila. Oh no, uh, I wanted to do my Spring Boot one. Actually, I think this is a Spring Boot one, isn't it? No, that's just regular source main Java. I thought, uh, yeah, so this one was uh, actually using This was using the test containers uh, bomb, what they had for JUnit and mapping to an existing uh, Spring Boot database. And when you did that, actually, since this isn't. Yeah, see, uh, down here, you always had to in Spring Boot 3.0 and earlier and two, you always had to do the data, the da dynamic property source in order to expose the generated URL using a password that was coming through the container. And I had to set up, uh, at the time I was using Docker desktop because I didn't yet have a cloud account. So you had to set this up in order to expose the ports to the Spring Boot part. Right. But then once you did that, you could say, yeah, there's my SQL container with the database and the environment. And this was how I initialized the database and all of that, and it worked great. And yet it's so much easier in Spring Boot 3.1 because this whole thing goes away entirely. Yeah, it's, um, that's, the, that's, that's one of those incantations that I've had to use for years, the dynamic property source thing. And whereas it's kind of cool and slick, I like the fact that the boot team said, why, why keep making people dig up the recipe for that? Why can't we streamline that? And poof, you know, that... That and the that and the Docker Compose stuff that they added in Boot three point one is also you know of epic nature, which Simon's they're already already posting about. Which part did you mention? The uh, Docker Compose support. So Simon's oh, also commented uh, on that. Yeah, we were mentioning Dan Vega earlier, and Dan's already got a video out on that. You know, on on starting up Docker Compose and as part of the Spring Boot app and all of that. So you're going to have to get on that, man. We need a vi another video on that. I mean, I could do it, but I think, isn't that your, your more your thing? <laughs> you do your thing, man. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do mine too. I mean, that's the thing, you know, for example, on the, on the no fluff, just stuff tour, there'll be multiple people speaking on the same topic. And, and for a while, you know, newcomers to the tour, are like, should I propose a topic on this? Cause somebody else is going to be speaking on it. And the attitude is, is just propose it anyway. If they choose to accept two talks on the same area, they'll be different anyway. Cause it's two different people. Uh, although I got to say that Jay Zimmerman never schedules any of my spring talks. Cause he just gives them all to Craig, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not surprising. I, I, I sense a whiff of uh, envy there. No, no, actually Craig and I, um, we get along great. And of course, Craig is tired of doing a lot of the basic spring talks. He wants to do the more advanced stuff and I'm willing to do the basic stuff. And just that message never seems to get through to Jay. <laughs> now the you, thing, I think the last time I saw you in person, I forget if it was in Santa Clara, potentially at a cloud conference, but, or maybe that was a groovy grails thing. But uh, I do remember you with your <clears throat> Spock shirt on Oh yeah, yeah. Star Trek, Star around. Trek garb to talk about Spock testing with Groovy. Which reminds me, in the documentation, I was looking at the here's the three point one release notes. Um, actually, it's not in the release notes, but in the Spring Boot docs, they actually have a little tiny section on how you could run Spock tests with Spring Boot, right in there. Like that, the container's already there, or the not the container, but Spock's latest version is based on JUnit 5. So it's just another engine, really. So all you need is the parser. You need to be able to parse those tests in Groovy. And as long as you have the proper dependency, you could do that in Spring. But I mean, what? There'll be three people in the world doing that? I don't know anybody else. Right. And <laughs> yeah. The moral so I of the story is if you're not writing automated tests yet, there, you, there are no longer any excuses to not writing automated tests. But this is actually what Simon was mentioning. I should scroll down to the. Oh, and by the way, that's this makes me happy. Is uh, Makito Five's built in there, you know, Huzzah. in the Spring Boot three point one. But we'll come back to that. So there's the service connections comment, and then here's the test containers part. Using it at development time was that part I was just showing you. I mean, you know this, right. but I'm just mentioning for the for the others that 
all you have to do is set up your container and mark it with a, see, this is the old school way with the dynamic property source. And now you could just say service connection and you could even wind up embedding it inside a main method. And here's the Docker compose part. I think, uh, yeah, Simon's comment, no more standalone Makito inline needed. Exactly. For those who do, were not aware, there's only two significant changes between Makito 4 and Makito 5. In Makito 4, if you wanted to mock final methods or constructors or static methods, you needed the Makito inline dependency, which is what, they, what brings in what they call the inline mock maker. But in Makito 5, they made that part of the core. So if you just have Makito core as your dependency, you can mock all those things and you don't need anything else. Now, the other change that happened in Makito 5 is that they brought in, uh, they raised the minimum JDK level to 11, which is interesting. I mean, I'm glad they did it. It's not like Spring's bold move of saying, no, 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 now you got to be on 17, right? And apparently Spring Boot 6.2 is already looking at features from 21, but I don't know if that's internally or going to require it externally. Have you heard anything about that? Well, the typically what Spring has done in the past is they may, first of all, they may compile against Java 21. It's just, I think it's in just discussions, but mm. um, for the Spring Framework 6 line, the generated class files will be Java 17 based. And um, so if you're using Java 17, it should work there. And they've historically gated stuff. Like if there's some, for example, back several generations ago, the version was Java 6. Well, the, one of the things that came out in Java 7 and 8 were, was Java's optional type. So right. at that point in time, Spring Framework would build using Java 8. There would be optional support, but okay. it would be gated behind a class check. So if you're on Java 6, that code didn't get run. But if you bumped up to 7 or 8, Spring's support for optional would kick in automatically. And so this is a... a, a a tried and true pattern that the spring team adopts. So I would see, you know, I don't know what's coming exactly in Java 21. Well, okay. The virtual threading stuff. So well, yeah. I can see stuff like the, uh, the, the virtual threading support being gated behind detecting if it's on the class path, but if not, you know, you're safe. Uh, anyway, that's been the tradition. Course. I can't point to an official thing that's actually happened, but that's the kind of discussions that are happening. For what it's worth, I mean, yeah, I, I just heard they were talking about 21 features in 6.2. Um, should, or should I say 3.2? I thought they said 6. Maybe they're thinking Spring 6 and not, not uh, Spring Boot 3. Uh, well, Spring Boot 3.2 would probably be the one that picks up Spring Framework 6.2. Right, right. Oh, there's a question, by the way, from Ravish. It says, uh, as a newbie to test containers, how can I dig into what annotation at service connection does? Now, the first thing to do if you're going to deal with test containers is you go to testcontainers.org. And the documentation is pretty good. It's not great. But what is excellent, by the way, is their set of samples. So there's, there's information here, like a quick start on how to use it with JUnit 5 and then there's features and then there's modules saying like how to work with a database or the other thing, by the way, that tends to get neglected with test containers is the, the, what do you call it? Web driver, except they didn't call it web driver at the time. It was, um, uh, not web driver. What are the, what's the older term for that? Um, Cor Selenium. Yeah. Oh so yeah. You do your browser automation with Selenium and, the, the point I was getting at is I think if I go under, is it under examples here? Then these are links to their GitHub repository. And like if I go to Spring Boot here, let me just give you an idea. You'll see that now I'm in there. Um, let me go to the top. Test containers Java project under the test containers organization. And here's the examples section. And these are really good. These will give you pretty much what you need to know. Now, this is the Spring Boot example is dated because it's it's the earlier version and everything. Uh, they have an application YAML, but if you look at the build file, you see it's back on 2.7. But the, the Spring Boot documentation talks about the test containers integration. I don't know if I have it here. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, There, there's a whole section of the Spring Boot documentation 
uh, 7.8.4 in the Spring Boot Docs. And that talks about the service connection that you were asking about. That's where that information is. So again, I'd be happy to paste this into the chat. I just don't know if the link will work, but heck, I'll paste it. Well, it may it work for me. you. It may not work for somebody that is not. I see. Channel. Okay. So at any rate, there's that. So it just just to answer your question. No, the while you were bringing up uh, JDK21 stuff. Oh, thank you, Simon. I appreciate that. So he verified that it, it came through okay. Uh, while you were mentioning JDK21, I went to openjdk.org, and this is the list of accepted JEPs, the job enhancement proposals for 21. Of course, everybody's talking about this one, virtual threads. I'm like finally relieved that after four count them four previews they're finally putting in pattern matching for switch as a amen because this one goes so well together with sealed classes you yeah, know exactly and yeah and it's like i can't believe i can't use my sealed classes without a default or whatever at any rate that's there and record patterns of course and they talk about sequence collections but sequence collections is just like yeah, there's a get first and a get last on every collection now, right? Or will be. Part of the magic of Java is not everything is like an earth-shattering release. It's sometimes yeah. there's a lot of little incremental things that if you go just add up all the differences after Java 8 yeah. and up till now, if you add it all up, it's something like, whoa, this is a powerhouse that I'm holding. Right. I mean, because 20 had nothing, absolutely nothing in it that wasn't either a preview or an incubator. So nothing. Really, and I, you know, it it's painful to say it, but I mean, before Oracle took possession of Java, trying to get something released was like, you know, you had to wait eons, and Oracle's like, let's start doing six month incremental releases, and that was ground changing for the Java community. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen this one yet? By the way, the Spring templates. Uh, no, I have not. I've not seen that one. Okay, so I got. Oh yeah, Project Coin is. Um, which one is Project Coin? That's um. I I mean, that was like ancient. That was like Loom was is virtual threads. And there's one that that does the startup stuff much faster. I don't think that's coin. Uh, bunch of little changes. Yeah, you're probably right. At any rate, I got to show you this templates part. And I'm trying not to color your reaction based on mine. So, you know, in most libraries, most languages, you put in like, uh, this is showing the old mechanism a dollar sign with curly braces, and that's how you can interpolate into a string. Well, right. let me scroll down and show you what it's going to look like. Not even that one. Yeah, this is what it looks like. Capital S-T-R dot, and then your string, and then they use a freaking backslash on the open brace so that this is just a variable, but they do show an example further down yeah, here of an expression being evaluated. Because if it was just a variable, you could use a formatted string. Just use string.format and you're good, or formatted, I think. At any rate, now they did this. And I mean, maybe it's just me. Well, actually, no, let me ask you first. What do you think of that syntax? Well, it, uh, I'm about to say we're finally starting to catch up with Python. Uh, Python's Colin done this for Ruby. like 15 years, but yeah. The Except other part is can perform arithmetic. I'm like, okay, let's watch out for all the attack vectors that are going to come with that. But no uh, doubt. But this has got to be the ugliest freaking syntax I've ever seen. I mean, everybody else does dollar sign and dollar sign curly braces, and it works just fine. Now I don't know about the attack vectors. I'm sure you're right about that. But, oh, my goodness, I mean, backslash is all over the place and invoking methods like this. And and then they're going to have things that aren't STR, like they're proposing, I think, a JSON one. Here's the multi-line expression. See, there's a string template with HTML embedded in it. Now, I'm glad we got our text blocks. We've only needed that since version one, you know. But look at this thing. I, I just have my hopes that somebody says, no, just don't do that. And here's a format template processor as well. So I don't even know what to say about that mess. I mean, look at that. This takes me back to like when I wrote C code, to be honest. I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I know I shouldn't be just sitting here criticizing. Simon, says, Simon is saying that uh, so much thought was put into it. And I'm like, was. Well, I don't think he was referring to this. I think he was referring oh. to some of the others. 
Uh, so Simon says that Jason was indeed mentioned during Nikolai's 28 hour Java stream. Oh, that, that already happened. I thought that was coming up. I didn't know that was done already. I mean, uh, Java's 28th birthday was yesterday. You caught oh, that? Oh, I, I missed that totally. Yeah, it was uh, tweeted out. I missed the live stream. I saw that it was, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Sherat, I think, tweeted about it. So, oh, they had the live stream over the weekend, huh? Because yesterday was the actual 28th birthday of Java, which I mean, made my career, you know, <laughs> I was a career yeah. changer. I went, wow. this is shocking to admit, I moved from Fortran to Java <laughs> without going through the chrysalis phase of C++ like everybody else did back in those days. Okay, how, I don't know you? How, to say how did you get into Java? Well, I don't know how to say it politely, so I'll just say it. It's like, okay, I I I didn't actually do Fortran in the field because I'm not I'm not that old, but I did study it in college, which still mm. makes me old. Um well, you I was a career changer. I was in engineering. And in engineering, the reason you did Fortran is not because anybody had any fondness for Fortran, but because that's where all the numerical libraries were. Yeah. So unless you wanted to rewrite all the libraries, and nobody wanted to do that you kind of had no choice. So I worked on something we used to call, actually it's called still, it's called computational fluid dynamics. So it was giant programs that were simulating aerodynamics. Mine were simulating aerodynamics inside of jet engines, but at least mine was two dimensional. The 3D, I had an office mate who did three dimensional simulations with combustion and swirl. And oh my goodness, he would run for months on a Cray supercomputer only to find out, uh, <laughs> did you ever deal with the um, uh, IEEE 754 specification? Um, I don't know that my career le leaned on, had to lean on that. I was aware of it, but uh, I wasn't writing simulations on supercomputers and booking thousands of hours of uh, mainframe time. Well, but, for those I mean, blessed people who didn't have to deal with the... Um, for those who didn't have to deal with that spec, when you divide by zero in Java with integers, you get an arithmetic exception. Divide by zero, no problem. If you divide by zero with floating point numbers, you divide by 0, 0.0, you don't get an exception. You get infinity. And if you multiply by infinity, you get infinity. And if you divide by infinity, you get zero. In other words, the program messes up and then just keeps blindly going on. And this is correct according to the IEEE 754 specification on how to handle floating point values inside a, a binary machine. And this is what Fortran adopted. And that poor guy, you know, my office mate used to run burn months of cray time only to open up his save file and find out that it was filled with infinities and zeros all over the place, nans and nan queues and all of that. Whereas if it had been integers, it would have gotten an exception and stopped it, you know? So I'm glad I never had to deal with that, but you know, Java you're saying is the answer well. is somewhere in the middle. Pardon me. The answer is the time old tale is the answer somewhere in the middle between zero and infinity. Yeah. Between I think zero and infinity. <laughs> but I mean, for somebody doing stuff, I've got like an eight, I've got an app on my iPhone. That's an HP 12 C calculator app on my phone. So I can Oh, sweet. Uh, yeah. Simon was referring to the one with the dollar. I mean, there is an explanation in here. I, I think it's, it's either at the bottom or at the top alternatives and now it's easy. It's it's. I'll admit it's very easy to go rant on this stuff, but yeah, there yeah. there's an element that the Java team has. It's you know, and it's wrapped in the fact we have a twenty eight hour, not an hour, twenty eight year history of this platform. Is they're trying to add benefits without ripping the thing to pieces. Like back when I gave my talk in two thousand eight on Spring Python, that was the day Spring Python three came out, and somebody asked me in my talk. Did I support Spring or did I support Python 3.0? And I said no. And the thing is, Python decided to make breaking changes in 3.0 right. and they right. suffered horribly at the adoption. Whereas Java has done very well at getting people to move up, move up. Even if well, some corporations are five years behind, they will eventually move up. And, and by the way, Simon's right. Of course, the alternatives are listed at the bottom, but here at the top, they do discuss all the alternatives, although I don't think I knew. 
this Python approach. I know very little Python. I know some of it. I've been, I mean, I live on, on Groovy and Kotlin and Java. That's been my career pretty much. I never really got into Ruby. So Swift uses backslashes. I didn't realize. And I know the these things are discussed within an inch of their life. I mean, they really do get into all the details and that's good. So I shouldn't complain. I just don't like what they settled on. I don't like the STR dot, although I have to admit as much as it kills my rant, I'm starting to get used to it already. <laughs> so I'm getting there. We can say the way, well, should it be all upper or should it be? Well, that's another interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, here, by the way, for those who are curious, here's Dan Vega. Um, here's his channel as well. And oops, got to stop his one as well. And this is the one I watched uh, today that is Spring Boot Docker Compose one. So he actually has a little video where he ran through that. I also watched his uh, AWS Lambda one. Um, he did a little demo on virtual threads, but I, I don't, I think that's a little premature. I don't think that's, it's time to talk about that yet. Well, um, there's also an article, a blog post, I'd have to go find it, that uh, our Spring Data team leader wrote, uh, Mark Paluk, about, you know, it's kind of the question, is virtual threads right for you? You know, call your doctor, are virtual threads right for you? <laughs> and he kind of goes into a lot of the discussion of like, what does it do? What does it not do? Because too many, I think too many people or maybe more of the fledgling members of our community are looking at, is this the next silver bullet that's going to save me? Okay, there are no silver bullets that are going to save you. So you need to understand where the payoff is and where it's not. Well, and the, the other thing is, I'm, I'm going by my experience with the Kotlin community, because what happened in Kotlin is that coroutines were introduced and then shortly after that, structure concurrency, because it's difficult to do the coroutines without being able to cancel a group of them at, at the same time, or say one through an exception, let's make sure the rest of them get shut down automatically. That's the, the structure concurrency part. And what happened is that while there were tutorials and everything on how to work with coroutines, everything gets really complicated really fast. So what ultimately happened is they migrated their way into the libraries, which is where they were needed anyway. Like the room database, that's their ORM system, uses coroutines automatically. You just make suspend functions for your persistence and it automatically works. And retrofit, their HTTP library, you know, that, that downloads RESTful web service data and right. converts it to objects that uses coroutines under the hood. And therefore all the day-to-day the -day developer does is occasionally launch a coroutine that invokes some suspend function in a library somewhere. And they're not actively managing their coroutines. They don't have to deal with that at that level. I fully expect that virtual threads will go the same way that we won't have to write our own multi virtual threading code, if you will, beyond a few demos, it'll all be under the hood, as you say, inside the servers. And I'm hoping that's the lesson learned because the, I mean, I really found appealing now it's, you know, a big, a bit of a bite to take on a project reactor style of yeah. write these little recipes. It's, it really kind of pushes some functional programming into your face, but if you can get the hang of basically, I think it's like Java eight stream API. If you can get the hang of mapping and collecting and transforming and filtering and flat mapping, if you can kind of get the hang of it, then it, it kind of offloads the thread management to the library. So you can say, right. well, this is run on a single thread or this is run on a batch of parallel threads. I don't, I don't really need to know that in order for it to carry out what I call recipes. Now, Anbu just pointed out here, let me show that one too. He says, at least two more Japs will be proposed for Java 21. Structure concurrency, right, because that one is a, an incubator in 20. So I expect that to be an incubator in 21. Maybe it'll be a preview, I don't know. And the scope values, if I understand scope values correctly, and there's, I may not, that one has to do more with value objects. So if I look at 20, there's scope values as an incubator. So by the way, I did, I did that awfully quickly. This is JDK 20. That's already available. And as I mentioned before, there's nothing released in there at all. It's all previews or incubators. So there's structure concurrency, as Anbu suggested. And that is, I assume it's not going to be GA. 
in 21. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be released. And then, of course, we have virtual threads, uh, which is now GA. And there's the scope values that Anbu was mentioning. So enable sharing of immutable data within and across threads. So it's a it's an alternative to thread local variables. Now, I haven't even looked at that one yet. Uh, if you have, feel free to comment. But uh, yeah, I haven't done anything with that at all yet. I'm not sure what the what the no, that one that one I'm not familiar with. But I do know, for example, like thread locals are sort of a in today's state age, it's a, an ancient relic, if you will. But you know, is something used effectively? You either had all or none, no control of the memory space that you're operating in, and but things like you know project reactors transfer like propagating context down the call stack in a totally um, uh, asynchronous fashion, you can't, you can't use thread locals because the, the thread carrying out this step may not be the thread carrying out the next step. So you need some, you need something else to do that. Yeah. And concurrency mm -hmm. like that's always easier with immutable objects anyway. So that's probably right. where the scope values becoming immutable get comes in as well. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. Now, one thing we've been talking about a whole bunch of different stuff, and, and that's been kind of fun, although I've been talking too much rather than you. <laughs> where's your book again? What Where's your book series? Oh, if you go to springbootlearning.com slash book, you can uh, find out. Oh, you can go to my spring, website there. Here's springbootlearning.com. And then I think I just scroll down to the books. So there's the YouTube channel. And here's the books part. Uh, and for those who are not aware, Craig has been writing basically a whole series of books, all called Variations on Hacking with Spring Boot. And there's version 2.3 and 2.4 and Reactive well, Edition. Are, yeah, those are those are sort of out of date now because I don't I'm not sure those are even supported. So I'm, I'm, I keep contemplating if it's time to take them down. But there's a learning Spring Boot. This is what I've done with Pack Publishing. And the latest edition is the Spring Boot 3.0 third edition. Learning Spring Boot 3.0, right? Yeah. Uh, is this it? At PAC? Yeah, that's it. That's from the from PAC. You can also find it about any other place as well. So either, like I think PAC has some kind of subscription service where you can get your get a, get a hold of it, or you can go to your favorite online distributor and get it either in ebook or or paperback. Well, I think you've got it at Amazon as well, right? Oh yeah, for sure. I think so. I mean, I. If I go look there, so let's look up you. So here's your learning book, Learning Spring Boot 3, Simplify Development of Production, Great Applications in Java and Spring. Um, I don't think, now this is self-published, right? That's on LeanPub? No, this is with Pack Publishing. Oh, that's the packed one, right. So that is available inside my Safari subscription. Oh, that is? I didn't know that. I think it is. Um, but the, the lean pub ones are not. So if I go to, I, I call it Safari, but it's obviously the O'Reilly learning platform. And I did not know it's over there. So that's well, a let's find out. question. I think it is actually. And there you are. See? Well, huzzah. I got a review over there too. One review. It was probably mine. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. I missed a comment by Anbu. Is a talk by Urs Peter at De here? Let me bring this up to the chat here. Uh, at DevOx UK about Project Loom and Kotlin, will coroutines become obsolete? Let me make a quick comment on that, by the way, because it's a natural question. Because what happened in the Android world is that people were using Rx Android, which is just an Android version of Rx Java, to do reactive because Android is focused on a UI, right? You've got a user interface and you can't do anything time consuming on the UI, just like you can't in Spring or JavaFX or any other UI toolkit. And therefore they needed a way to get off the user interface thread and they used to do risk basic threading stuff. And the idea was, oh, thank you. Oh, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> any rate, um, I'm sorry for those who didn't see it. There's that's a comment there from Spring Boot Learning of all people. Yeah, who are they? Yeah. At any rate, uh, what happened in the Android world is that as soon as they switched to Kotlin and therefore had coroutines, I mean, within a couple months, Reactive was dead. 
nobody was using Reactive anymore in Android. Everybody was using Coroutines. But that was a different problem than than the normal ones we face. I mean, we're, I expect that to have a huge impact in the Java world as well, but the real key for Reactive, the, the problem that Reactive solves is, I mean, I know I should, I'll get your comment on this as well. I always use the fast food restaurant analogy that if I go into McDonald's or whatever, some fast food restaurant, and I put in my order and the cashier submits my order to the kitchen, if it was a purely synchronous environment, we would both just stand there staring at each other until the lunch came back out. And if it's asynchronous, then the cashier hands me a receipt with a number on it. That means I can get out of line and grab my soda and grab a table and get ready for the lunch to show up. And the cashier can serve all the customers behind me. And the driver here is that the time it takes to handle a request, the IO layer, to submit a request is so much shorter than the time it takes to fulfill the request, to make the lunch, that that's where Reactive really becomes beneficial. And coroutines aren't going to change that. If it still takes 10 times as long to service the request as to receive it, then Reactive, I think, is still going to be important. But if all you're doing is just getting off the UI thread so you can go do something and then come back, then, yeah, coroutines are going to make a huge difference. Now, you've written a whole book on this stuff. What do you think? Um, you know, that's actually, uh, I actually used that analogy in one of my previous books was the, the whole front of the house, back of the house thing to, to feel that. And I, I kind of saw that actually like firsthand one time when I had, I had to go pick up my daughter from school like a few years ago. And it happened to be a date where several, like half a dozen people were in there talking to the receptionist and everybody was like, they, they said something to the receptionist, then they filled out the form to check their kid out. And then they sat back and waited for their kid to come. And I noticed, you know, each person did the same routine. So they're all executing the same flow and, but they're having to wait for the response, but it didn't require them to stand there and synchronously block the receptionist. Mm. She was able to file the request and get it back. And so I, I, I spotted that. I'm like, that's what, that's what reactive is right there. The whole idea. And Sometimes the person that brings your kid up to you it doesn't have to be the receptionist. It's somebody else could bring the kid to you and then you're out the door. So that's the, it doesn't have to be the same thread that took the request is the one that serves the response. Well, and the, um, and the really critical thing there is that coroutines isn't going to change that. Right. I mean, coroutines is going to replace a lot of reactive applications. I expect the web flux module not to be quite so popular, but it, that problem is just a natural reactive problem. That's not going to go away. You know, and, and something else that I've seen is I, I, people keep looking for silver bullets and it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So <laughs> people are like, you know, is, is reactive like faster? It's like, no, but trucks are, are not faster than cars yet. They're the backbone of our commerce. Why is that true? Because we can load several tons of freight in a truck going 50 and the truck gets you know, has a higher throughput than your zippy car going 80, but the car can't haul anything but a suitcase. And so think about why that's the case. Interesting. I like that. Um, I should say we've, we've kind of gone over an hour here and that's fine. I just want to make sure we're at least keeping the timing in mind. Uh, is there anything else that you are doing these days or working on these days that, that I should mention here that we should bring up on the stream? Uh, well, some of the hot stuff that we've 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 uh, released out, like in Spring Data JPA, is we actually I went and built a parser since February for our uh, Hibernate and Eclipse Link. Well, anybody writing hand, where you have to handwrite a query for Hibernate or for Eclipse Link, um, we actually implemented a parser so we can handle some more sophisticated stuff, and we're starting to see a, a new wave of people that are picking up Spring Boot 3.0 or 3.1 that have written hand uh, handwritten queries. Um, We've a, a new people, a bunch of people have come online using it and said, Hey, there's a bug in your code. I'm like, okay, I knew this was coming. We can fix it. It's very, the, the parsing stuff gives us a nice surgical approach to go in and fix the right thing. Cause it's like, Oh, I didn't see that. That's a good point. So, but I think we're providing more features than ever before versus fighting tiny, you know, tiny, hard to spot, hard to solve bugs. Instead, we're, we're like, okay, what's the features we can get out there? What's the, what's the value we can keep bringing to the community? Is that parsing JPQL? Is that the idea? Um, 
Well, we parsed JPQL and HQL, which are slightly different. It's, yeah, uh, you parse HQ. I didn't. I never even tried to do HQL with with Spring Data JPA. But uh, it's. I think though, roughly speaking, like nine out of ten people are probably using Hibernate, or maybe ninety nine out of a hundred. But did anyone ever like ask you to parse from object? <laughs> That's my favorite ultimate hql statement right because it, it i, I didn't everything. know about that one until i started to implement my part i actually found the bnf format for jpa specification and i was like uh, um i i went and pitched this idea at our at our face-to-face -face spring data team meeting in february back in boston and um i was trying to make it a surprise so i had found the bnf for that and i'm like the, hey this i can handle because in grad school i actually wrote parsing like i did parsing with lex and yak so oh god that's so far beyond anything i've ever done i mean i just remember when i was learning about hibernate back in the day when it was still kind of shiny and new the idea was that you could say first of all you didn't need a select clause because everything was assumed to be select star and that's a bad move but that's what everybody did you can't do that in jpa you can only do that in hibernate and then somebody said well you could do select from a parent class and it would choose all the children as well, or you could select from an interface and it would grab all the table rows that were part of a class that implemented that interface. So ultimately you could write from object and probably grab your entire database, just about, except for the join tables and things like that. You could grab, you know, way, way too much data <laughs> that way. Yeah. If you, that's, Thankfully, though, the Hibernate stuff or the, the JPA annotations will stop you because the you'll, you'll have inevitably gotten one of those associations wrong and it'll just stop dead in its tracks. And, oh, no uh, doubt. No doubt. Know. Yeah. I mean, it, and it'll give you like <laughs> 30 layers of indirection to tell you what went wrong in there. Oh, well, um, is there anything else you wanted to bring up before we uh, wrap things up a little bit? No, this is good. We'll have to we'll have to do this again. Yeah. I mean, oh my goodness, we got a lot more people than I was expecting for an inaugural, you know, screencast. I really appreciate everybody who was kind enough to join. And if you can, you know, subscribe to the Tales from the Jar Side YouTube channel, as I say, I've I've got I hit 300 today. Oh boy, you know. <laughs> oh, that's what I need to do. I need to make a Thermopylae joke, don't I? Right? If I hit 300, <laughs> then there's going to have to be some assault by the Persians, which we ultimately lose. I mean, they lost, you know, but at any rate, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Let's not get too morbid with this live stream. <laughs> it's a good point. At any rate, you're very kind of you to, to be here. I'm a great admirer of the work you're doing and, and of especially, well, how generous you've been sharing all of it. That's just very, very kind of you. And yeah, we'll definitely do this again. I'm hoping to make this live stream a... Uh, a regular thing. I don't know if I'll be able to do every week, but maybe every other week. I'm going to try to do that at least for a while, see if I can do it. And now that I know there's actually an audience, oh, the Oklahoma joke. That's right. Thank you, Bill. I forgot. Yeah, the uh, I was hard to tell that got distracted. I was in Montreal of all places. And I was in a teaching a class. I was in a hotel that evening after a day of class and I'm having dinner and there's these two guys at the bar who were talking and I didn't mean to, to overhear them, you know, but they were talking very loudly. And one guy says to the other, so where are you from? And the guy says uh, something about, uh, I don't think he was from Oklahoma. I think he was saying that he spent time in Oklahoma. And the other guy said, uh, you know, do you know why Texas doesn't fall into the Gulf of Mexico? And he said, no, why? He said, because Oklahoma sucks. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. I'm sitting here. I'm in freaking Montreal and I'm here. At this. <laughs> so now, actually, recently, for what it's worth, I read a very good book about Oklahoma City. It's called Boomtown. Have you ever seen that? No, no, it was a quite a popular book. It was about a combination of Oklahoma City history in the context of the uh, basically they're stealing the NBA team from Seattle, you know, with Kevin Durant and, and Russell Westbrook and everybody at the time going to Oklahoma City. And it was about the a season where they nearly you know had all these high hopes and everything. But it told a lot of history and it was extremely well written. Uh, my friend uh, Glenn Vanderberg recommended it to me. That's another Texan guy, by the way, another Dallas area guy. Uh, and it was really, really good. And that's 
got to be more than ever. I mean, Oklahoma is one of, I think, seven states in the country I still haven't visited. So I, I haven't missed it, but <laughs> anyway, any rate. But you're in, you're in Tennessee. I guess you're, you're not happy about John Morant these days, huh? Oops. <laughs> don't, don't try to grill me now on sports trivia, okay? Because okay. I'll fail that miserably. That's your, uh, your star on the Memphis team, so for what it's worth. Okay, well, uh, any last comments in there? I don't see anything else we have to address there. And I, once again, I will say thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I will end the broadcast. And, of course, it, the recording will be available on the YouTube channel pretty much immediately after this is done, right? That's how it works, isn't it? Yep. And uh, you take care, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye.